So I felt bad last time because I was hoping to sort of do something that would be beautiful and wrap it up in five minutes. And then I was looking for the grand finale and then it didn't come and I was like, where is it? And then, okay, so I'm gonna just walk you through what we did last week and where I really want to end and then where I thought I should end and then how I'm not ending. And so I'm gonna just clarify this all, okay? I told you we're gonna do constrained inversion. Yep, undetermined problem, I under, oh wow, well, look at that. And it further shows how the closer to your notes you are, the less well you can spell. Under determine, right? That's to come, we haven't talked about that. Linearization of nonlinear problems. That's gonna be Geiger's method. Geiger is the name of earthquake location method, which is known by various other names. I just mentioned it here because, you know, this is 120 years old and you'll find it under that name. And then wrap this up. Because if that was 45, that was sort of a unfulfilling page. So I promised better with 46. We're talking about data space. I want to fit a line in the normal best fitting least squares framework, but we want to implement one specific constraint, that point. Let's go through there for sure. This is an additional point. This is a whatever, full blue point, okay? Same model as before, this is our new twist. Then I gave you the general notation and I said, if we're asking for one point, you know, we could ask for all sorts of other things a scalar constraint, some scalar function of some vector parameters is a scalar zero, some vector function of a vector parameter is a vector zero, those are just options that are gonna come our way. I drew in exquisite detail the contour lines of some hypothetical phi cost function, a quadratic cost function, doing the usual, measuring something in the residual data space. And then I drew, a contour of some phony fake gamma function that I want to satisfy it's an example of a scalar function that has a value at the vector point, the vector a, b, and I'll tell one back. And here's my zoom of that. And I try to make the argument that what you actually want when you get that, or what you get what you, when you want that is for the gradient of the cost function phi to be parallel, but opposite in direction. But that was my choice of sign. So let's go with parallel, proportional in other words, to the gradient in the thing that you also want. And this is the picture that you need to have in your mind, right? The blue contours are where you can go. And I drew the solution, right? At a point and I've made my point here. When I was walking away from the lecture, I was like, you know, there is of course this physical analogy that I might have made, right? That, think about it. Let's say you are not at that point. Let's say you're here on this cross, right? And now you're imagining the local gradient of your blue contours of your cross function. You know, it's going to keep pulling, right? At every point you have a gradient of the green function and you have a gradient of the blue function. And the green function is a line, so that's sort of like a rod. And then I imagine that you have a rope tied to a rod and you're pulling it in the direction of your blue valley. And so, if you imagine that and you're just pulling, you're pulling at an angle and you're gonna just move along that rod. And so then you're gonna move your solution along that green rod, which is the thing that you want to stay on. And then you pull, pull, pull. And then at the point where you're stuck is where the point where those forces meet this sort of balance, right? Where you pull towards the blue as much as you can in the direction that will maximize your value for money or value for force. And when it can't move either way, then that's where you're still and stuck. And that's where you're stuck. Anyway, so there's a sort of a mechanical analogy that I sort of had in mind. Then that's your solution. So then I wrote that generally in my notation with the proper underlines. The gradients are all vectors. Gradients of scalars are vectors. Scalar lambda. That's the scalar function constraint. Vector function constraint. Grade, gradient. 
the gradient. The gradient defines the vector, that's the vector. The gradient of gamma is a tensor. It's one step up, or it's a matrix. But the dot with the now vector lambda parameters removes that dimension again, and so you're back to a vector. That's just notation. I love the notation, it works. There's very few inconsistencies. There's a handful of things that are sucked in there, but it's a physics-based notation, and it is uh, of the very few things of this era made in America. So uh, making gradients sucked again, this is so-called Gibbs notation, okay? You will find a bewildering set of notations. This is the one that we use in seismology, which is ultimately propagated by some famous textbooks, including one here, written here at Princeton by Darwin and Trump. And that's the notation people. And as soon as I switch after several years of doing other things, I, I really confused. So, the central thing about the Gibbs notation is that you write out the dots, two vectors together with a dot, adjacent NC, some Einstein notation if you want, but you get a scale. Every dot removes its potential, subtracts the notation. So, while I will make mistakes, I will always try to correct them towards this Gibbs notation. Then we have 48. He's like, let's go to our example. And I drew your attention to the fact that phi here, wow, is our usual quadratic. Or well, we're always doing it. minimizing the norm of the residual as a quadratic misfit. The new twist was the green things where those are linear constraints. I wrote it out. I want you to see that, right? The quadratic is you're not fitting things exactly, you're fitting things in the norm. That's very different from saying this is equal that. So right here in this example, we literally require to be on the green contour. We require the solution to have a certain value consistency. And then we're doing the best we can with our model adjustment. So the fact that this quadratic versus linear fitting in the norm versus fitting the actual thing, fit for real I added here is, is, a, is a useful thing. And that makes it an entirely twisted, you know, new twist here for us that we haven't seen before. Class of problems of, of linear programming, LP. Vector case, same thing, double underlining, bold face, capital F, that's my Gibbs version, dot N minus B, vector equals zero, underline vector. Then I gave you one example. I went to the scalar case. I wrote that one up, right now. The scalar case, I take a gradient of both sides and that's what you get. I still need to have my equation satisfied. That's what we have here. Then I rearranged it and I just stuck it all in a matrix notation with, you know, here, that's not Gibbs, right? I mean, it's Gibbs inside of some matrix multiplication rules that you know how to read GTD equals GTG times M plus F transpose times R lambda and V equals F times M plus zero. And then there was a brief spurs of confusion where I, I reflexively wrote two underlines on the zero. This is just zero. It's literally the number zero because look at it. F is a vector. It's a row vector. I didn't write it, but I added it. So that's an extra row. Then you need a, an extra row. If I flip it by transposing it, then I only need one extra number. And so this zero is a little pivot here. Okay, I tipex that out so now you're seeing I want to stand correct on that. So that's the equivalent to this problem because it's not the equivalent, it's just the same thing, right? It's the notation. And uh, if you're in doubt about this notation, just say there was no constraint, and then you recognize, of course, that's the same thing with the same solution. And so that's how you read to make sure that it's in right. All right, then I went back my example and said, all right, let's just write out the constrained fitting of a line, which incidentally is on Menke page 62. So that was our constrained fitting. Must go through point. If you aren't confused, do ask yourself briefly the question, is this a point that we already have? No, it's a different point, right? The data are n data points, 
selected as n, I stand correct on that, independent variables, that's an n, subject to a constraint with these two points, x star and y star, which didn't exist in that data set. And then I apply, I drink my own medicine, and I say, from what we've had, now I explicitize this little f and I show you, okay, that's one x star and then one x star flip and then the zero is a number, it's just a flip and the lambda is in there. What's the interpretation of lambda? Well, it's the thing that makes the gradients match up. So do we care? Not really, not now, not today. Can you find it? Yes. Here's where I more or less ended, I think. And I was like, oh, I need to write this like one more step and then I sort of lost it. So let me just show you, I think you should not write the following down, but since it's recorded, you can write it down later if you want. I want to, you to write this down for sure, right? But we have that. So stop writing and start looking. I think I may have added the next thing where it's like, you know, let's just write what GTG is. I figured maybe I was missing something. I was trying to be quick anyway. So you write this down. We've done that before. That's just a statement of GTG. That's the thing that I complain about in Menke that he writes all these sums down and who does that anymore when you're having MATLAB, which by definition is great at matrix multiplication. But anyway, I thought there might be, you know, I wrote that. Then I was like, okay, let me write the inverse of that. That turns out to be this which don't write it now, but just look at it. Also, it's in Menke on those very pages, right? So that's the inverse of that. Then I was like, oh, I'm gonna go find what matrix inverts this. I also wrote GTG out just for the heck of it in sums, right? Also, these things, that's the sort of Menke stuff, notation right? So then I looked for, what was I missing? I thought I was missing something. I, I may still be missing something, but anyway. So um, that's where I left it thinking, what do I need to write to like bring this home in five minutes? So I need, you all know that the solution is the vector B A lambda over two. I want it. You all then know that I need to find its inverse of this block matrix. Clearly you can stick it in MATLAB and just take inv and see what happens. And that's what we'll be doing ultimately. I can't see from here automatically that it will be invertible without doing some work, but that's why I'm trying. So in trying this, I was like, well, first of all, I didn't end anywhere after doing more work. So I like, you know, special case, right? What are we really doing? This is for you to appreciate a sort of a, where am I looking when I can't find it? Okay, well, this is our special matrix, right? It's, it's symmetric in a certain way and it has that zero. So this is my, there will be elements A, B, one, B, C, D, one, D, zero. That's my schematic notation for this uh, particular uh, matrix, which has particular symmetries. This is the A, B, one, B, C, D, one, D, zero. That captures all there is to know about that matrix, which I now call A, whose inverse I wanted to find, okay? Then I look up the by hand definition of the matrix. This is why I've been telling you, you all need linear algebra. You need various ways of doing the inversion. You either hand crank it through, collect the terms. You know the determinant comes out in the divisor, in the, what is that called? The denominator and you also know that there's other things and you could do it via one, two, three, four, five different methods. Either way, anyway, when you're done for this particular matrix, and again, don't copy it. It's like, just look at it. It's just for you to, and it's on record if you want it, right? And it may be wrong because I'm just, you know, doing it. So here's a determinant, 2BD minus C minus AD squared. And here's the inversion. You know, minus cofactors, that's all that lingo. So remember, I am looking for the inverse of this matrix, M thumbs and so on. You see all my tipex here where you're like, where is this going? I think this is it. And like, I don't see it. Like, there's no way I was gonna write that in five minutes. 
not even there yet, right? So the solution is this, don't copy it, right? But I'll, I'll, you'll have it here. I think this is right. And you know, it crosses out and the X is special. And you know that if there's no constraint, it's back to, you know, these terms. And I thought it would be in a book somewhere, but I didn't see it. And anyway, you're never gonna calculate it this way. So at the end of this thing, I'm glad I didn't take you through it. Certainly not live because I'm not sure that we learn anything by writing this out explicitly. So I'm back to this here. If you set up a constraint inversion problem, I like fitting line to a point set and fixing it to going exactly through a point, the best way is to just make this matrix use in bin MATLAB and try your luck. If there's no constraint, it's simply what we had before. That's point one. If the constraint is that you need to hit the origin, this is worth writing down. It's quite interesting, maybe, I don't know. It's just inverse of the X transpose X, where I don't even really need the transpose in my Gibbs notation because it's just a vector. So I'll just take it out. Well, but in MATLAB, I would write X transpose star X, right? The single parameter you get, which is the slope, is just dot X with itself invert it, which is really one over dot x dot d. So that you can do, that's easy enough, which leaves us with, you know, with general inverse problem, gm equals d. The things I now remember are the general inverse is gt, g transpose, g inverse, gt, d. That's the equation I say I remember. If you should want the line go through a point, if you should want that point to go through zero, zero, and it really just simplifies to this one over this times that. That's just, just again, that's actually easy for the sum of the squares. If you want to stick in a particular point constraint, write this out. No need to look for a magic solution, I think, because I couldn't find it. I thought I had it or it existed, but it doesn't look any prettier. So just do this. And maybe the last thing is that, well, what is another extreme case of this linear inverse problem is to say, oh, there's only one parameter and it's not a slope, it's an intercept, Like right? A single slope solution is this. A single intercept solution is what we've done before. And that was called the mean that gave us the mean. I think that's kind of interesting. The general solution is GTG inverse times GT times D and the constrained solution is an inverse of a more complicated operator, which you just build yourself. So then I started working on an example, which uh, I don't want to do now where, you know, I write it out. And I think you, you could do this if you're so inclined just for the fun of it by saying, let me just write a function of contours. I'm not quite finished writing that. I'll just flash it here for the record where you know, what is the shape of this constraint? Well, it really is an actual line. And what are the shapes of these contours? I haven't quite worked that yet, but I might do it computationally. And then you will see that these are the constraints if you're trying to go through these points and you see exactly that you hit this thing. I'm just flashing it here so it's on my record. I don't think you're gonna learn any more right now without that. That's gonna be on a non-existing page 52. So I'm now here bringing you back onto this page and saying, all right, what in the end did we get? And let's write the constrained inversion one final time and then apply it to yet another special case, which is where I really, really want to go. So in my grand scheme of things, page 47 says, write out the scalar case. Now I say write out the vector case, the vector constraint case, right? Where green gamma, is a vector function, vector valued function of the, of the unknown parameters in. And I'm going right away to what hopefully then isn't a surprise, but it's all gonna look the same, except I'm gonna write it properly. And that is that we will be looking for the solution M and the vector of Lagrange parameters. I'll just write it. La Lagrange parameters. Our usual M is the usual unknown. And I'm going to say that 
we'll be needing an inverse to the minus one, right, if you will, but I'll type in for the signal that this is doable in MATLAB using in because these things end up working well. And that we will be having as we had before, whatever the original problem was. Then the augmentation, let's begin with the augmentation of the data vector. So here is now GTD. What do I write below? Is it Y star? Yes, uh, but in the general case, in the vector case where to, to sort of fit with that original sort of notation here, pick one of gamma F, M, V or zero. V? Um, yes, the values, right? So here's my fat, bold, stout underline V. That's the equivalent of Y star if there was only one value, it'd be called Y star. And uh, what do I put here? Is it a zero matrix? That's our bold zero doubly underlined, however many I need to fill it. And what do I put here? Capital F. Yep. Uh, matrix. With the double underline. This is gonna be big old F, bold F, transpose. Okay. That's the sort of thing I remembered, and that's why I was briefly confused with the vector notation here. And that just specializes to if there is only a vector constraint and the matrix really only has one row, and then I uh, switch to lowercase f. And then you're still having a dot product which ends up in a scalar constraint. So I think you should remember this because that is a, a fruitful way of thinking of constrained inversion problems. And just like we did with you know, weighted inversion, we said there'll be a W. Well, here, whatever the constraints are, if it's a set of linear constraints, there'll be an F. If it's line fitting, you got your G covered. If you wanna go to a point, you know, make your F very simple. You wanna fit a sinusoidal periodicity, well, that will fit into the Gs because you'll stick ones and sinus and offsets and lines. I mean, like anything can go as long as it's a linear model that is GTD can go in the top left. And your additional constraints, as long as it's a linear combination of parameters related to some values you want, goes in there. So you could say fit Newton's law and make sure that the weighted mean of the parameters is high for some reason, right? You could, you could really, it is applicable to a broad class of problems. Now, all right. Now I'm going to do what I really wanted to do. And that is that over-determined problem. And I'm gonna make you see why I went through all of this. Maybe I'll start a new page for that because I'm sure I had a page started at some point that says the overdetermined problem. And so now we're in the underdetermined problem, purely underdetermined. So remember purely overdetermined is the line fitting through a bunch of points, only two parameters in the line and you have more points so you could do it. I make you now think back to our early little thing, which I called a little problem on page 28. And I'm like, you know, remember, uh, remember GM equals D. And what if you're trying to fit the line to one point? That is an example. That was our first example of a purely underdetermined problem. It's not that you can't do it. It's just you can do it an infinite number of times. And so you have no idea what the best way is. It broke down because of our determinant being zero and so on. And we're like singular, ill posed, ill conditioned. And I promise more to come. And remember, we fixed it quickly, didn't we? because we're like, all right, I'll just stick in some a priori information and that does appear to fix it. And then that led to a particular new class of regularized solutions where it had that lambda. And there's no surprise that that is a sort of a lambda because the lambda is floating around here and the lambda is gonna hit home in a second. So that's a regularized inversion. And how was it regularized? Well, it particularly damped because it tries to keep when you think about it, the norm of the solution also small. So that here was a particular way with which we 
quickly fix some underlying problem. So now I'm going to go purely, purely underdetermined and say we have that case. Now I need to make sure I explain this right. Now it comes out differently. So earlier we were saying, I remind you, page 38, little problem, page 39, I'm copying. We we're saying, let's make I that says got some data, try to make a linear model prediction out of it by finding the unknown parameters that when in the quadratic least squares, ordinary least squares regression norm of residuals prediction minus data, like all those same words here, sent, minimizes this, the U. And then we had said, uh, but we can't do it. So I'm gonna add a little lambda here. And that led to our solution, which was M2. And if you don't remember, go through your note. I blue boxed it and I yellow inside of it. If I can find my yellow pick. The thing with the lambda. That was then, this is now. We knew that we had to do something special to that earlier thing, which I call a little problem on page 38, because we could find an infinite number of solutions that fit an infinite number of lines going through one point. What does that really mean? That means that we can really get the error on the data prediction to be exactly zero in many, many, many ways, right? If I have one point and an infinite number of lines that go through it, Every one of them has a zero prediction. So I'm going to turn this problem completely around. And I'm going to say, we need to just rethink and we need to see it as follows. Well, how about this? Let's try to minimize a phi, which I shall make the quadratic norm of the model parameters. And the implication is as best I can and Let's just say that we know we can fit the data exactly. So now I'm going to subject it to a linear constraint, which I know I can do exactly. And let me make that linear constraint fit the data to zero residual. Remember, there's a quadratic now, but it switched from the data space to the model space in my retelling of the story. And now I make it the sort of the data fit a thing that is exact as a linear constraint, as a thing I know I can do, which I'll add here. Remember the problem we fixed was that there were an infinite number of exact fitting models. That comes out right away when I say fit a line to one point. So I made the model and the data space such places. Well, maybe that's good for me to say I'm delightfully ambivalent about the way that, what these arrows mean here, right? We're usually thinking of phi as a data fit, more, a data space norm. And then we've been adding model space norms to it. And then we're saying, well, now we're going to add constraints. And those constraints could be parameter constraints or the model space constraint. And then now I'm switching those roles and saying my little phi now, well, I just made it a model space norm to minimize and my constraint is actually a, you know, a mixed space. It's a residual space, linear constraint. I know I can do that because I have a purely underdetermined problem. And so I'm saying, whatever it is, get me parameters, fit the model, fit the data exactly. So now I can do one of many things. I can do the quick route, which really is why I've been on this path. And I could go a long way. I'm gonna to go to quick route. I'm gonna say, ah, well, I recognize this problem. That was a general solution. So now I'm going to write out the case that corresponds to this box thing here for this new case. I'll begin by saying my solution is going to be a set of model parameters, which I need to find. And there's gonna be a Lambda set, which I may or may not care about, but I do know I need. And now I'm going to at the risk of alienating my audience here, I'm going to write an intermediate step here. This is what I want, but I'm going to write 
one intermediate step, which allows me to skip a subsequent step, which allows me to get to the solution. Uh, sorry about that. It's just placement here, and that's why you're writing in pencil, although you should be writing in color pen. Okay. So I'm going to write the following. Here's my M again. Here's my lambda again. I'm taking, again, my inspiration from here, right? And I want to now fill these things here. So somebody helps me out here. What goes in the lower left, which to this problem embodies the vector constraint? This thing that we used to call F, you can pick anything of phi, M, gamma, D, G, or zero. Mm -hmm. I want that too, right? That's my constraint. So here I got GT, and my zero sticks where it is. What do I write in the top left? Gamma. Gamma, kind of, we no longer need because gamma, like, gamma really is D minus GM equals zero. So that, I think, leaves D. Where do I put the D? How about that? Other side, right? D needs to go here because I got to read. G times M plus zero times L is D. And L, I mean land. Top left. I'm going to do it for you. You know it relates to what you say about phi. It's about phi, right? And um, it's about how phi interacts with M. And phi interacts with M in the following way. It says we're making a quadratic and actually, you know, in earlier times, I would have said, let's write a general quadratic with an M dot. Remember that we did sort of a WTW where we're good, we were working with weighted inversions and then I'm like, I use a, a covariance matrix and so on. So that's where, so when I see M dot M, I see a quadratic with an identity inside of it. That's how I weight the model parameters. So I want to just write it and say, this is where the identity matrix goes transposed and multiplied with itself just to make room for later on where there would be a weight. Here, this is just ones and zeros. I'm not writing, that's why I was briefly confused here. I'm not writing the equivalent of the solution. I'm one step behind. I'm writing the equivalent of the problem. And I'm writing the equivalent of this problem Maybe I'll give it the same color like I did here. I know it's confusing to go look. I was boxing this like I did before. That was my problem. Then I went to the solution. This is what I'm solving. I'm going to give this an equivalent box and say, all right, this is the problem I'm solving. And I got one spot to fill. So what do I put there? Read from the left to the right. I'm going to want to end up, okay, I might just write I at this point because I'm not writing the quadratic. I should write I, actually, that'd be better. Not that it matters because I, T, I, T is I, right? I'm writing that I dot M equals zero in the least square sense. How do I get I dot M equals zero in the least square sense. Well, that's like it used to be G dot M equals D, which means I subtract what I want it to be, which means that, aha, that's how I get M dot M to be minimized. I want you to read, right, that I dot M equals zero is the linear problem, roles switched, mutatis mutandis, that leads to minimizing a phi, least squares as M dot M. And then I need you to have no imagination to just write that G M equal D is my constraint. Then I proceed by analogy to everything that went before to like fill out my GT and my ear and I'm done. Okay. So I didn't, I think I took it through all the steps. So that's the problem. Now I'll write the solution. And this is where I actually get a cool looking equation. So now I want to solve this problem. And I just want to recognize it as a now overdetermined problem. I had a data model problem that was underdetermined. Now I started trying to model data problem. And I just like, I got too many choices of data space things to work with. So I'll just go call this good old G augmented M equals D. So I now pretend this is a 
g prime times an m prime times a d prime. Again, don't confuse this. It's everything switched. This is supposed to be somewhat mind boggling, right? But I can summarize it as a matrix vector multiply equals a thing. And I reach for the first solution in the bag, which is the GTG inverse GTD. Turns out that if I just write this down and I will form, but I'm not doing all the terms because it takes too long. But if I say, well, that would be G prime transpose G inverse times G prime transpose times D, my good old M1 solution, which I reach for because it's handy. And then I write it out. Then I get this M lambda equals, and now I'm just doing a painstaking writing and collection term, which you just end up with the solution. You verify it's right. Well, you'll see it'll verify in a minute. So now I'm building my linear operator that does this, given that, and I know it needs to multiply zero and D, which I separate with some pencil. And now I'm copying from my notes because I've done it before and I can't talk you through it until I'm done. So here's a zero, as many as you need. So I'll double underline it. Here I get G times G transpose inverse times G. Here I get G transpose times G times G transpose inverse. Here I get negative G times G transpose inverse. You multiply by hand these two bracketed matrices and you can verify on your own that they're each other's inverses. Multiply, collect terms to the usual and you find block matrices of I's and O's. So that checks out. And what do I take away from that? I take away an important yellow box truth from here, which is this. The one I really care about is what is my solution, people? My M is going to be zero times zero. So I forget that. But it'll be given by G transpose dot G dot D transpose inverse times D. So I'm a box in that and yellowing that. Because in our parade of solutions, this is the long awaited M hat five. Okay, so take a look at that. That's now joining my list of solutions, and I call it M5. And what is M5 other than the fifth one in this list here on page 41? What do I have so far? The good old overdetermined solution, purely over. This so-called arbitrary special case, which we didn't contextualize then, but we're like, you know, some augmented form of something that is trying to do something when it's getting hard. So, you know, that's sort of the solution. The one with the weighting, the rewritten special case with the reasonable weight things. Now I'm on the fifth one, which you see is completely different. I'm gonna just copy M5 here in what needs to be read. And that is no longer GTG inverse GTD, but rather GT dot G dot GT inverse. It's like you're reading it from left to right or from right to left times D. Okay. So this here is our latest in the list on page 41. That's our latest solution to a linear problem, which explicitly treats the case of purely underdetermined problems. And I want you to know now that we got there via constrained equation, which you know you learned something else about, which you could use in other exercises like research problems. I sort of argued that if I went through all of this baggage of 53 and then this switch 
And then I'm like, okay, and does that mean I can just write the solution? Then I wrote the solution, I verified its solution. Anyway, I end up in this way, in a way that I like because it's short ultimately. And I have a whole new solution. So having the solution is one thing, but now you also know why it earns its name is this now is known as the minimum norm solution. Minimum norm solution which is a horrible, horrible name. Because if somebody says I'm doing a minimum norm solution, you have to ask three questions. One of them is, what do you mean by norm? What sort of norm is it? And then somebody has got to tell you, Ooh, there's many, but you know, this is an L2 norm, right? Quadratic people, quadratic. Second question that needs to come up in sentence says norm, other than are there still any Cheers fans out there? It's the norm of what? The answer is, well, it's the norm of the model parameter set. Third question you should ask, is your minimum good enough? Or another way of asking is, does, does your solution make my posterior look big? That's the Bayesian version of that. So once again, I went slow, but I don't mind. So in our list of solutions, we began with, you know, OLE, a regression, and that's purely over-determined, more data than parameters, no issue, you write it down. Then I gave you an immediate example, which is a very strong example that said, oh, you can't do the inverse. One way that you can immediately see that you can't do the inverse if you're doing a purely underdetermined problem, but I haven't used so many words yet. So I gave you a sort of a fake solution to that which says, you know, supply some other information. Now you can do it because you can invert GTG plus something inverse because that helps. And so I call that the so-called arbitrary special case, which you are going to then discover is going to be useful for mixed determined cases. This so-called arbitrary fixed arbitrary case is a useful thing it's also a general way of regularizing solutions. I talked about the numerical stabilization. Then I talked about a statistical stabilization. I promised you it would be all coming together. It's getting there, right? And so that's M1 is the canonical left inverse of G. I might as well add this now here. What happens with this? So the solution is some operator that works on the data. I call that G to the minus G. I call that general inverse. I talked about PNs and I talked about more Penrose and I threw out words. I don't think I threw out this one. This is the so-called left inverse. Why? Because when multiplied times G, it gives you I, that me, right? GTG inverse times GTG is the inverse when multiplying from the left. Now I am on my fifth one. And I took you from a completely different place, same problem, but I've gone through constraint inversion to switch and bait you, first bait you, then switch you, into saying, well, that's what the solution should look like. And yep, now I come up with this solution. I now know it applies to the purely underdetermined case. And now I want you to see that, whoa, whoa, look at this. This operator has changed. It's a right inverse. That new thing, right inverse G, because if I take G and I multiply it by it, I get an I coming from the left. See that? G times GT times the inverse of G times GT with a mathematical statement of I. So you learn more terms here, left and right inverse. And I will have more things to say about that. I'm going to put these pieces now together and they say, the way I derive the solution seems a little convoluted, maybe, I don't know, but it's super handy. We can generalize this norm to M weighted by anything and we can start sticking this here. You could do this explicitly by using MATLAB inverse on that. You can solve constraint problems of all types. I mean, these are all solutions of things that you could do. This one I did by hand, right? This is the manual solution kind of because I knew the answer, right? Sticking it in there, then going, that's how that arranges. 
and then I find out this solution, which most textbooks do in a completely different way, and which I will say one way of this solution is the one I just did, and I deliberately went that way because I think you're learning more. I could also revisit the solution to this problem, right? This is our problem. My first solution was restate the problem in a way that by recognizing it as a constrained inversion, I can write down these entries and I can rate it again, just the way I did that. And then this was the vector matrix case. And then I kind of wrote down the solution by going through my M1 inverse, believe it or not. And so here it is. So now I have this. If I revisit this problem, then I can come up with a second way of solving this problem, which is the way I think Menke does it, which is just crank through writing the gradient, setting to zero, solving for lambda, plugging it in, and you get the same thing. And I'm going to spare you that because it ends in the same thing. This is more Menke's way. If I have time, I could do it. It takes five lines, which is more than I want to do now in a minute, because it ends in the same solution. What I want you to know is that M5 is a minimum norm solution. Now, I think you know it because I went through a constrained version of that that says I can fit the data exactly. It is purely underdetermined. I have no residual, but I got to pick from all of those, the ones with the minimum norm in the model space defined as M dot M. And of course, that's a way of regularizing and that gives you this formal solution. And in this process, you also have a lambda find a lambda, I've solved for lambda, I just don't bother to think about it much. Lambda is this, right? Whatever comes out. But so I, I re regain my flexibility, right? I can make my vector constrain anything. I can make my norm constrain anything. I, could, I have substantial flexibility. Well, I think I can quit here while I'm ahead on saying the left inverse is an operator from a G matrix in a linear problem, GM equals D, that gives you the best fitting least squares data prediction in an overdetermined system. This new thing is the right inverse of G. When you have a completely different system, when you have more unknowns than you have data, which we have, by the way, in the earth sciences all the time, for the simple fact that we live on a surface and we want to know the volume of the earth. There's much more to know on the inside. So we always have indeterminacy or underdetermined. If we're straight up asking for a simple solution, the mathematical form that does this, well, then you get this solution, which is a minimum norm solution that you will read about in many, many books. That's the right inverse of that. This then connects to notions of resolution and variance and so on, which, which we will visit or revisit. And then there is all the cases in between where I think you should be befuddled at this point and like, I'm not really sure how well determined my problem is if I have GM equals D, you know, I might have, as we have in seismology, millions of model parameters and hundreds of thousands of data constraints. And we don't really know which is which. We don't know what the well-constrained parameters are and the ill-constrained parameters until we try. And so there's gonna be some in inherent notions. No, you can't write this down and just do it. But in that case, the M2 solution is the sort of start where you're saying, I'm going to regularize it already. But in many, many cases, including for people in more chemical or engineering systems, you're going to want this solution because you can write your down, down your problem. You can do it by hand. You can do this inversion. And then you know that you have, of all the data, of all the solutions, you have found the one with the minimum norm. So I draw my last picture here. And remember that we had an apple and a pear costing a dollar. And then we said, well, you can't find the solution to what is the cost of an apple plus a pear equals $2. What is it, right? It could be anything between B equals two and A equals zero and A equals B equals zero. And the solution lay on a line. It all goes and my problem broke down if I did it the traditional way. M2 was a way of fixing it, but I didn't tell you how to pick a lambda because it's subjective at that point. Here, M5 is the one that says, of all the solutions on that line, pick the one that has the minimum norm when you sum A squared plus B squared 
That's the L2 norm, right? The minimum length. Why length? Length in people's minds means L2 norm. So what are all my solutions? The dashed line. This vector is a solution, but it's an ugly solution. This solution, bad. The cornered solution, they're all too long. But the M5 solution is the shortest one of them. Because of all the vectors that are lying on this dashed line, the shortest one in the Euclidean L2 normal thing way in which you think of distance and length is the one that goes from the origin to the perpendicular of the line. And that's your M5 solution. And if you read that little article I showed you by Cleve Muller, who was the writer of MATLAB back in the day when it didn't exist, that's a two pager where he talks you through the fact that there's all these gradations in between. He mentions P inverse, he mentions all sorts of things. And you know, this is the beginning of a beautiful friendship with the sort of solutions. It's not the end of it. At the end of my road here by saying, look, M5 is where you end up when you treat such problems. Would it be okay if I spend five minutes on this homework and if you need to leave, you just leave, but it'll be on the record because then you can start. So here it is, right? The simplest nonlinear problem I can think of is earthquake location, which is the problem I give you. And what is the problem of earthquake location? It is find a model primer set, which is an X point, a Y point, a Z point, Cartesian space, and a time. What do you have for data? I'm going to call it T0. This is the unknown. When did the earthquake start? And it's not an earthquake, right? It's actually an explosion because earthquakes are more complicated than this. Somebody fires a shot and you hear it, and somebody else hears it, and 10 people hear it, but they're all in different locations. You have absolute time, and now you got to compare notes and say, I heard it here, then I heard it there, then, and you got to work out what the location is. By the way, this is what some police departments do that are setting up microphones around cities to get, you know, early locations of where gun violence happens. So the data here are the times that, you know, arrivals events, if you will, have been recorded. So you don't need to know any seismology. There's a source at XYZT, and there's receivers, which I'll call R receivers. And while I say this, I made these little vectors because they're locations, right? I'm not implying that I have more than one. I may have more than one dimension. So you would, I don't think I'm going to undo the bars here to say one earthquake, one origin. So that's the origin, the arrivals of things that happen. You hear it, bang, and it's at X receivers. The crucial thing is why does this thing nonlinear? It's because if I write the time equation, the ith arrival time is the unknown origin time of the earthquake plus how long it took for these waves or shots or signals to arrive at where you're listening. And in a medium velocity V, which right now I make known, but which in the real world is also a, a solution parameter, I'm just simply going to write that my relation between my data T and my model parameters is this here. It's the square root of the sum of squares, the way anyone would know it. It's the xi receiver and how far it is to the source, plus the yi receiver location minus how far it is to the source, plus the zi, oops, not fitting, minus how far it is to the source. I was going to make these all red. Okay. So, However, your receiver is from the source in X, Y, and Z. 
in the distance, Euclidean, sums of squares, norm, the whole familiar thing that we have. So you got to square these contributions and then stake the square root. And that's the distance divided by the velocity. That's the time. That's how long it takes. And so you know you cannot, if you tried, write this as a t equals g times whatever m type of model because it, it doesn't work. You got square roots to do it. Okay. So the relation is not d equals matrix m times m, but it's some kind of a curly funky g that is, you know, this, that's g, that's the model, the box equation. And it relates to the model parameters in this way, which I cannot capture as the matrix equation. So I'll just call it curly G of M. I think I led with that way, way back saying G could be anything. And so this is a case where G is anything is not linear. Okay. So now the one and only trick that you need to do, which is everyone's starter, is to linear eyes. And that is called Geiger's method, but it also in seismology, that's what I use it for. This is what I tell you to go read in either Lay and Wallace, which is a chapter I put on the e reserve. You Google it, you'll find a lot of information about it. It literally just says, let us not solve for the M that minimizes D minus GM in the traditional way, but it says, Let's find a delta D, which will, um, sorry, let's find a delta M, an update to an initial guess, knowing that the gradient of curly G is the relation between how a change in model parameters relates to a change in the data. So I don't want to spend an hour here and I will return to it, but I want to have you start thinking about it and reading about it because there's a little bit of self-work because I think I need to um, move into the next chapter here. But this is a statement, this is a Taylor series. If you think about the fact that you're asking how does ti minus t0, right? ti minus t0, assuming you have a beginning solution, is a data update, right? Is a residual, is an evolving residual. If you begin with an initial guess for x0, y0, and z0, then at every station, you have however much is wrong by. It. If you then say, well, look, ti minus t0 is this, then you have a nonlinear relation between that residual and your model parameters. But what you can do is you can say, well, look, this residual, if I had a better guess, I would make it better. And so now you can say, with respect to the current solution, which might be zero, 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 or whatever evolved guess you have, differentiate the change in model parameters. And you see that it relates to the gradient of this function. So you would expand the travel time into a Taylor series. And so you differentiate this quadratic function at the point of your yes, or your evolving solution. And then you're asking by how much do I need to change my evolving solution X, Y, Z, T for the earthquake in order to bring down my residual. And all of that I'm capturing here in this notation that says the change in the residual that you update is related to the gradient of that nonlinear function. And now if you begin from somewhere, anywhere, and you have a misfit, and now you make the linear relation between the update required to get to a residual that ever tends to zero, then you're just using the normal methods 
to drive an inversion not in D equals GM, but in update to D is gradient of curly G times delta M an evolving position of it. And so that is Geiger's method. You begin with a solution that you try a guess. You calculate your arrival times. You calculate your distances. You calculate the residual. You differentiate by hand the G function. You take out a half, you lower the power, you divide, you know, the, the usual differentiation of this thing. And you make those the entries of a linear relation matrix. And then you check that indeed that gradient changes your data residual in res with respect to your model update. And then you start an iteration from an initial guess and you watch your solution evolve until your delta M is small. So I'll say iterations are K. The K update at some point, at some point you can't improve it because your update is small or you're getting no more residual improvement. So either you're not improving the model, which means you've already hit your limit, or your model update is small, or you're just tired. So an initial guess followed by linearized gradient update until either your model doesn't seem to be going anywhere else, your data don't seem to be improving, you're fit to the data, or it's been running for 75 days and you're like, you need to call it quits. So that's the stopping criterion here. When max iterations is reached, model improves, not at all. And data improvement is no longer any good, then you stop. And here, I'm not giving you the rules. I want you to see, I want you to play. That's why this homework is short in statement. I give you a travel plan. You give me an earthquake location. I do want you to do this thing, the differentiation of this travel time function by hand. I give you the material for it. And then I want you to set up a thing that is ultimately just gonna use it M1 solution, the GPG inverse DT times D, but it's going to relate the model update to the data update as opposed to the model to the data like we usually do. 